Military is a daunting thing in any grand strategy game, and this one is no different, especially when you're new to the genre. Today I'm going to be telling you all about Imperial to Rome's military system, how you can interact with it, and maybe some strategies to use with it. But if you haven't already, check the playlist in the description below. I have a beginner's guide where I go over all the basic systems in the game, including military, so maybe that might be a little more bite-sized than what you're looking for. But to start, military in this game is represented, initially here, by these figures, these men walking around the map here. You can click on one of these and you can get a lot of detailed information. What you're looking at here is a legion, but a levy or mercenary group will appear with this same aesthetic. Your first time looking at a military unit, you're likely going to see this, no matter what kind of military unit it is. So let's go over some basics. Also, I'm sick while recording this, so please hope you can suffer through my stuffy nose. If we look at what we can see initially just from on the map here, this number is the amount of men that make up the legion, the levy, or just the combined amount of units here. This number is directly drawn from manpower, except in the case of mercenaries, and we'll talk more about that later. This number right here in Roman numerals, this is the martial ability of the commander in charge of this number of units right here. The higher this number, the better, especially in relation to whomever you may be fighting. This bar right here represents the morale. Morale is also very important because it dictates how long primarily you can fight and potentially how well you do but there's more important indicators for that and this flag indicates who is in charge of the largest stack where you are looking to find a military unit that is already deployed you'll want to just find them on the map which you know you can pretty much pick them out right Everything with the, the K's or like large numbers after them. It's also naval units here. See 124? That's the amount of ships that are here. As you see though, this number 2 indicates there's actually two different fleets here. And if we click between them, we can definitely see a very different amount of ships. With this one only having about 17, 18 ships. It actually says that right here. Total strength, 18 ships. And this one having 106. And there's a lot of information to digest there. If you're looking to... Find your units for any other purposes. If they are legions, then you just have to hit the military button here. Go to legions and all of your legions will be listed. You can also get more. We'll talk more about that later. And your levies can be found on the levy page with a slightly different user interface where you would raise them, where you could find them to raise individually, and where you can also tell them to stand down either bit by bit or one by one. But we're still looking at what we see. So you click on one of these armies and etc let's digest the information in front of us so this right here is the monthly cost of this army and this is showing you when you hover over it who costs what so the commander costs me 1.91 ducats i think is the currency per month there is the regular cohorts and this is just you know the units you see here that's costing me almost seven Loyal to Commander is still regular units. Loyal to Commander just indicates that if worse comes to worse, these units are going to side with the Commander in charge of them right now, not you if there's some sort of rebellion. As a result, however, they only require two-thirds of the normal monetary funding because this guy is paying that other third and that's part of how he ensures their loyalty now this gives him power base but this is not the tutorial to talk about power base total strength here this is the amount of men we have this is like i mentioned this is the actual number of men and this comes from your manpower the numbers here are one to one and then there's also 56 cohorts that's what these numbers down here are a cohort is a amount of unit a formation of unit it's like when you recruit one Horsemen, for example, one heavy cavalry, that's one cohort, and that'll give you a certain amount of units. As you see here, it's usually like 500 
per cohort. One cohort is what you'll recruit at a time. It's equivalent to recruiting one ship at a time. Just under that, we have the food capacity. You'll see here this bar is how much food you can hold. Green is how much food that you have. The number is also showing how much food that you have. Hover over it and you can get information on how much food you are using based on your current situation as well as it might give you information on why you are gaining food, why you are losing food, and how you performed last month which you can compare to this month to try to figure out your food stores. Food, by the way, can be increased by carrying some supply trains with you. Supply trains are the primary way to carry food, otherwise every unit can carry what they can carry, but the supply trains will grant you way more food, way more longevity in the field. To the left of food, we have morale, and we kind of talked about that earlier. This is a more proper view of morale, how much you have, what's affecting it, its recovery, and any text that you have that might modify it. This little button right here is how you change your commander. These are commanders you can change from. This is affected by a lot of things, so we'll get to that later. This is your current commander that's in charge of these forces, but there can be multiple, as you could see, there can be multiple in a way. Up here at the top right, this is how you give automation. So if just controlling this is way too much for you, you could give automation. For example, select this and the unit will go around your country doing whatever they want, whenever they want, interacting with and accounting for other units that are automated. This is ultimate, like, full automation nothing else would take a unit more out of your control than this they'll go on the offensive they'll go on the defensive they'll do whatever they want defend borders if you select this they're mostly just going to stay in your own territory they're going to defend from enemy attack and if necessary they'll retake things that you lose carpet siege this specifically tells the unit to go after, see these territories, every single enemy territory, instead of going for important places to attack, such as fortresses and etc. We might talk more about that later. They won't go for important locations, they'll go for every location. Now, in a normal war, you might not want that because a fortification can control all the land around it. That's why this says it can be useful during great conquest wars and civil wars. That's because in these wars, war is a bit different. When you capture a territory, it immediately joins your nation. You immediately annex it. There's no peace screen, which there usually is, to go through a formal annexation process. It's just instantaneous and we might talk more about that later. Reconnaissance, units sweep for and report enemy movements in the vicinity. Basically, a small fast force that you could put together, let's say light cavalry and such, can be used as this to simply run around trying to find the enemy, to relay that information back to, say, units that you have on independent operations. Then there's keep in reserve. Units stay behind and unless superior, avoid the enemy. This is if you have very small units, be they levies or legions, that you don't want to engage the enemy on site, but you want to keep in the area, keep in reserve, will kind of keep them in that role. Right next to select unit objective, we have the attrition. This shows you your attrition based on where you are, and it'll give you some information on why, such as the supply limit of a region, which as we hover over here, we can see the supply limit is currently 41, but the weight of our unit is 77. If your weight is above the supply limit, then you're going to have some problems because you you weigh too much. It doesn't mean you literally weigh too much. Weight is more a calculation of how many units can fit in there and sustain themselves in that environment with the technology that you have and the civilization of a region. This can be raised by civilizing, getting technologies, and operating with smaller forces to discourage players or AI from stacking up massive doom stacks that kill everything that comes near them, although the AI will still try to do that anyway. Over here you can see any modifiers that your legion or your levy has, usually this is based on what kind of unit it is. Go further below we have this array of buttons here as well, let's close this. We have this to basically say other units can or cannot, it'll say which one, believe the words that are written here, can, cannot, attach this unit. What that means is, and I can show it off best over here, we have four different units here. Four different levies, four legions actually, and they're all here. If I went and took the largest one, which I have, and said attachment allowed, 
then on these other units I could opt to have them attach using this which it's already attached attached to unit and then I can detach it in the same way I can attach it so that all I have to do is move and I can show you actually all I have to do is move this first unit and then every other unit will follow after it see I only had to give the order to one unit whereas if I did not allow attachment well, I just simply detached everybody else right the other units stay there so that is the value of attaching it helps you control massive units at once it makes sure that they walk in sync even if they're at varying speeds so that none of them fall behind and get picked off by enemy forces after that we have the button to build a road once you have a certain tech level you will be able to just build roads with any legion or levy that has at least 5,000 men in it i believe and to do that you just turn this on and you walk around move as normal the entire time they're in this, they're going to be paying more maintenance, they're going to be moving uh, more slowly, and they're not going to be as ready for battle, so their morale is going to lower. But, they, you see these roads here. They will build roads connecting whatever province you start in whatever territory to whatever territory that you're connecting to. And you can essentially make a road connecting any territory to any other territory around it using this even if it seems redundant every new road that you lay down does generate the bonuses that roads generate this is not a tutorial on infrastructure though let me know if you want a tutorial on infrastructure having activated that you can see the rest of these have kind of grayed out so let's ungrade them and you can see there's some other things here so for example there's another road building option here build military road this is actually way better than building a road it's not different than a normal road it's just a roman road basically you have this if you have a roman road technology it's actually a tradition this tradition basically means you have all the prowess of building roads that rome had in history and the way that they represent this is by not upping your legion maintenance cost by, as you can see here, 120%, doesn't up itself at all. You still don't move as fast, the same debuff to movement applies, and your units are actually always going to be ready for battle. The morale will not reduce. So this is just, if you have this, usually you're Rome. This is the superior way to do it. It costs way less over time, and that's what this is. Next, we have Drill Army. Now, you could technically do this with any kind of unit, Legion, Levy, or Mercenary, but this is really what Legions are best for. They will cost a little bit more while you have them drilling. Let's put them in drills so you can see. But you're essentially training them is what you're doing. They will gain experience monthly. As their experience levels, as you can see here by showing the subunits, go up, they will perform better in battle. Additionally, they will contribute more experience to your nation, which will allow you to unlock, and let me show you, traditions faster because every tradition regardless of its effect is unlocked with this military experience this is how you speed it up and this is also how you give your legions especially a fighting edge because they're always deployed anyway they're the perfect ones to for a little more maintenance keep experienced and ready to fight and there's certain things you can do to prevent the decay of experience as well that's usually in technology or other military traditions next we have force march basically this will make your unit way less sustainable the weight will go up your morale recovery will go down the whole time this is active but you'll move 1.5 times so 50 percent faster than you otherwise would this is great if you want to get somewhere as soon as possible you just cannot wait and you do not care about the effects that this will have on your attrition or your men at all that's what that is and finally we have unit reorganization this is for if let's say you just got beaten in a battle your morale is shot and you need to get it back your men are dead and you need to replace them to get back up to strength this is what you want it'll cost a hundred percent so two times the price and you won't really be able to move as fast or anything your movement speed gets reduced, but you will reinforce and get your morale up much, much faster. So if you lost a battle or for whatever reason, your morale is low and you need replenishing, this is what you need to select. Just note, this cannot make new manpower appear out of thin air. It could just draw from it faster. While I have this open, it's worth noting. Remember how I pointed out loyalty of units earlier? You can actually tell who's loyal, who has loyalty by hovering over these little hands. If they have a hand, they're loyal to someone. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they're loyal to their current leader, because you could replace the leader 
And these guys could still have a loyalty just to somebody else. Now, that means if that person's not the leader, you won't benefit from the effects as much. But there also isn't the danger that he might just take the troops and run around with them without your permission if his loyalty goes too low or if there's some sort of rebellion situation. But they will stay attached to whoever they are loyal to, and that grants power base and power base grants, well, influence, and the more power someone has, the less loyal they are. That can be problematic. Sometimes it's really just good to swap through legates because a lifelong legate in charge of a... Legion, for example, can create many loyalty problems and a usurper to your empire. Now, the buttons below these ones, I fucking hate these buttons. They were way better in the first UI, as I recall it, but maybe I'm misremembering. The color scheme is completely broken. Now, you may be seeing like, oh, we can't do this one, right? You hear me clicking. Can't do this one. That's why it's grayed out. We can't do any of these, right? That's why they're grayed out. Well, no, in fact, they're not grayed out. They just look grayed out. You could barely tell if you look at these two, and they're clearly grayed out. Look at this one. It's still gray, but there's a slight border. That's a bluish color here. You see that? That's how they indicate that you can click on these ones. It's not red. No. It's, it's just... It's barely blue. It's like gray blue. That fucking helps. <laughs> I've seen mods that change it. And it's, oh, I hate this. Anyway. So be very careful to look at these. Look for that little border. Look for any little reaction when you hover over it. It will at least put an X to show if you cannot use one of these options. Let's get that out of the way first. So what do they do? So create new unit means, let's say you want to go ahead and take units from this and put it into a new unit. Usually you'll do that with a legion. You can't do that with every unit type, but you would hit this and then you just select what cohorts you want to move to the new army, and then you move them over. If it's a legion, it'll draw from your pool of commanders who can be found in your legions. You click on one. These are your pool of commanders. This is what you saw me pulling from earlier. This was the limit you assigned these commanders here, and that's where you can get them from. Or you could just split in half, and just the game will try to put it into two equal halves, assuming it can, like as much as possible, based on what it's made up of, whether you assigned it this way or it came this way. There's a couple good reasons to split up armies. For example, if you have an army that's as big as this, then you might have too big of an army. The weight might be too high. You might have trit everywhere. So you might want to split it in half and operate this one legion as multiples, just simply because you're able to get so many troops. And with legions specifically, the amount of troops you can get are, in fact, limited. We'll get to that when we talk more about legions. Reasons. Other than that, other than just supply, why you might want to split this up. If you just have so many, it might be beneficial to you. Let's say you only have one legion, which is very common for most of the game. You have one legion and it might get pretty big. Why have one big legion attacking only this city, right? When I can have two legions of 14,000, you know, 28 split in half, attacking two different cities. That might be way more effective and way less a treaty. And so that would be reason to do that. Another might be to split off supply trains to go move them somewhere where they can stock up on supply, bring them back, or split off fast units like light cavalry that you might have coming along to form a temporary reconnaissance unit before returning them back to their parent army. This X here is to disband an army. Depending on what kind of army it is, this could cost money. This would literally cost me money to disband because I'd have to pay off loyalties among other things and then get rid of all the equipment, etc. I get the manpower back. This is obvious. This is how you get rid of a unit. Consolidate cohorts. This basically means that, it, let's say you have all these cohorts and they're absolutely fucked up. You could actually just merge them together to suddenly make them stronger. You'd have less, but you could rapidly make the ones you still have stronger. It's a good way to recover if you need to really quickly, but it's gonna cost you in the long run because you'll still have to recruit new cohorts instead of just filling the logistical cohorts that you've already created. Detach siege if you're partaking in a siege, and I, I think I'll show you one later. You, this is how you just, you get out of the siege. Detach support, well, this is if you have, for example, supply trains, these are support units, and engineers, these are support units. They do different things. If you want to just, 
detach them and only them immediately, this is a good way to do it. For example, if you don't have NGs, you have supply chains, you want to detach the support because you don't want them in the combat or you want them to go get supplies from somewhere else, this would be the button to press to skip the work of actually doing it manually. Anabasis, anabasis, I don't know how to say this word, is basically if you have some sort of government and military setup where you can actually put your leader as the leader of an army, any kind of army, you could go around your country, pay some political influence once you get to a location, and by paying that influence, doing Anabasis here, you can increase the loyalty of that region immediately for that price and give it a two-year bonus of a royal visitation to get its provincial loyalty trending upwards for that time. That's what Anabasis is. Embark Army is like, I have this army and we're on the coast, you know, let's say we're on a coast, we have a port here, we put ships here, we could immediately embark this unit onto those ships, assuming that there's enough ships, and we'll talk about the requirements later. We talked about attach, order full retreat, that's like, we are in battle, and we know we're gonna lose. So we just order a full retreat so we could save our men, save our manpower, try to recuperate for a battle that we can win. You could also just do this from the territory of someone else and it's going to automatically run you back to your territory somewhere. If you can go without using this, it's usually better, but you could still do it. Desecrate holy sites. Basically, if there's a holy site in the world, of which there are many, you could desecrate them, pay some aggressive expansion. There's many reasons why you might want to do this and I've spoken more about those in my buildings guides, but they have effects, negative and positive. There are strategies of why you might want to use them, and I've already discussed them in other guides. This is the button on how to do it. Root out pirates. If there's ever a pirate haven, and you can find these pretty easily in your diplo map, just look around. There's not a lot here. We went really anti-piracy in this playthrough, but okay, here we go. You're looking for something like this, this little flag. That's a pirate haven. If I did that action over here, then I would root it out, I'd get rid of it, and then this has its own effects. The main one is getting rid of the Pirate Haven. Whether you want to keep them or not is up to you. They have benefits, they have cons, and there are other ways to get rid of them by event as well. Military Colonies. If you have certain military traditions, you can create a military colony. The idea with this is that you take your units, they need to have enough, like, stuff, enough ma manpower, you need that. You need to go to a place that's unclaimed on the map, such as up here, these places. And then you can create a military colony, which will essentially immediately place down a fort there and claim the location for yourself. This is one way to claim land. It's an expensive way to claim land, but it's a pretty decent way if you're trying to set up a series of border forts. That's what the... That's what that system is based around, is the idea of Rome building border forts along the unsettled territories with the barbarians. Right in the middle here, we have our tactics, and I've talked about this kind of stuff a little bit in my beginner's tutorial. Tactics are based upon what kinds of units you have in your, your setup here, your army, and which ones are available to you depend on your military traditions. For example, we have the special phalanx, this is a Greek one. The rest of these are just default, and there's even more. They work well with certain kinds of units. Those kinds of units are not actually displayed here, it just shows you how your current units will interact with each of these. It's showing you the total effectiveness of a tactic, what units are contributing to it, and then also how strong you would be with this bonus right here against different tactics. So for example, with shock action, this is one of the most basic ones. We'd be very good against anyone using envelopment and against anyone using Padma. Vuya, this is more Eastern. You're very unlikely to see anyone even using this unless you play further East anyway. But you'd be at a debuff for damage if you were fighting someone with a phalanx, which we can use, or bottleneck. You see, we're actually using bottleneck. The total effectiveness isn't always what matters. The most important thing is countering what your enemy uses. So I can't tell you which one to use and which one is best because I need to know what tactic your opponent is using. And so that's what you have to look for. But generally the idea is if you're fighting enemies using shock action, use bottleneck. If you're fighting enemies using envelopment, use shock action. If you're fighting enemies using, oh shit, deception, use envelopment. And that's just kind of what you're going for. 
the higher effectiveness you can have, the better. But sometimes your effectiveness is not buffed so much that it's worth it. Because an enemy might use multiple tactics across multiple armies. So you might be using shock action. You might have it because you're fighting enemies using envelopment. But that doesn't mean that some of those enemies aren't running around using bottleneck. So rather, your best idea might just be to find a tactic that is neutral against both of them. Because you can't have no tactics. So in that case, I might just pick bottleneck, see? Because I'm very effective with it. And it doesn't interact with anything, any of these. It's completely separate. So if I encountered any of those, then it would just be equal. I would not have a bonus against them, and I would not have a debuff against them. And I would guarantee that, at least. If you want a guide on something like, you know, matching tactics with units, I suggest looking at the wiki to get the exact values of how every unit interacts with this. But if you want a guide on making armies as well, let me know in the comments. I can make a guide on anything that I experience in. But moving on, next we have, we're gonna skip over this. Next we have these right here. Primary cohorts, secondary cohorts, and flanking cohorts. Your primary cohort is the type of cohort, in this case I picked heavy infantry, that will move forward ahead of the army and engage the enemy first. This is really good to either use some sort of skirmisher or some really heavy kind of unit for. For example, think Carthage in real life. Carthage had elephants and then they had their swordsmen, they had cavalry, things like that. A really good idea for Carthage in real life, and this is what this mimics, is they'd put the elephants in the front if they were smart. They didn't actually do that because they were dumb most of the time. Put the infantry behind them to move up and support once the elephants had caused havoc in the front lines. And yes, this game does simulate this. So you want to think like this. The whole reason the game lets you decide this. This is very, in my experience, Hearts of Iron 3. Like, they really took this shit out of Hearts of Iron 3. And then flanking cohorts are affected by flank size. So you can decide how wide of a flank you're going to do. Two cohorts, five, ten, it doesn't go up any bigger or smaller than that. This is the amount of cohorts you're going to try to put on the flank. The reason you can't go much higher or lower is because there's a limit to how many cohorts you can even fit on a battlefield. And you can see that when you're in combat. There's a combat width of how many units you can fit through. This is how much you'll try to fit through. And you can pick your primary cohort that you're going to try to squeeze there. Just because you pick... For example, a primary cohort for any of these does not mean it's going to be the only one ending up there. For example, if I had light infantry here as well, they're going to find ways to sneak into combat based on their role, the easiest places that they can go. That covers this screen pretty much. So let's go to a slightly different screen here. This is the Legion screen because I just want to continue on that conversation real quick. When deciding what to put where, for example, I said elephants are good in the front. I think that's pretty much universally true. You're looking for certain kinds of stats. Unfortunately, they don't show you the stats unless you have the unit in front of you. But there's ways to see them on the wiki. There's ways to see them in the game. For example, I see what I have in front of me here. I could also just go to mercenaries. And I could look through all the mercenaries out there and see what they're using to find the stats of units by hovering over them as well. I could also look at my levies, which right now they're all deployed. But what they would deploy here is there as well. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. But when looking for what to put where, there's a number of things that can affect your decisions. I cannot give you a, this is the best because there is no best. Because you're going to be fighting a variety of enemies, right? I have heavy infantry on the front. Because look at their stats. They only really suffer when going up against horse archers, light cavalry, and camel cavalry. Basically notable skirmishers, all of which are cavalry. Heavy infantry are very round, very useful units, but they're heavy. They consume a lot of food. They're not very fast at all. They can't store an insane amount of food on them or anything. The wave for supply limits, this is their heaviness. This is bad. Light infantry are way cheaper. These are light infantry. They're way cheaper to make. They're way cheaper to keep. They're way cheaper to use. Light infantry stats, however, are going to be worse. They're going to be weaker to more things. They're going to be strong against less things. So it's really a matter of cost and efficiency that you're looking for. Additionally, units get buffed up by technology. They get buffed up by your tradition. So there's also, what nation am I? What traditions do I have available to buff certain units? And so that will have you picking as well. And I believe you can kind of see if you look over here at the ledger at cohorts, you can see what's buffing up your units from resources to tech to traditions to figure out what units are best for you in terms of just raw efficiency. That's another thing. 
So that's how you decide what your army is. Now, maneuver is a very important stat that never just gets explained anywhere. If you have a unit on the flank, you need a unit that has at least medium, you know, to high maneuver. I don't have a very good army on the flanks, admittedly, for this, but it's better than my infantry. With a maneuver of two, maneuver actually means how far away you can attack. This is range. However, this only really matters on the flanks because it affects how efficiently and how quickly your flanking units can reach and harass your enemies. It's really perfect for something like horse archers. Horse archers are perfect for the flanks. You know, they'll have a very high maneuver and they can then be very efficient on the flanks. You're not looking for something extremely heavy or necessarily just extremely light. You're looking for something that is high maneuver and that you can financially sustain for the flanks. Whereas like in the center, first and second lines, you're looking for things, a mixture of light and heavy that you can sustain that are not only effective and efficient as per who you're playing, but effective and efficient as for who you're going up against. Heavy cavalry I actually more often see used as a frontline fixture to go in and then be supported by heavy infantry. And that can be very, very effective. They would wipe the floor with any kind of cavalry, chariots, archers, very, you know, light infantry. Light infantry and archers are very common to have on a front, and heavy cavalry would wipe the floor with them, although they're even harder than heavy infantry to bring around as a result. They move much faster because they're on horses, but send those in against someone like Carthage, who has war elephants, you know, some Indian country, uh, maybe Egypt even, then they might have a really bad time being on the front. So you'll have to adapt your tactics potentially. Now that only applies for legions, just so you know. Now let's talk about legions a little bit more real quick. Uh, right up here, you can see the cohorts. This number on the left is the amount of cohorts you have in a legion that you've hired. The number on the right is the amount you can have. The reason why you'll see my number here is higher than what I can support is because at one point I could have a higher amount and I recruited it, but then the amount I could sustain went down. It doesn't get rid of the unit, it just means I can't recruit anymore. This value changes based on your integrated populations. The higher amount of integrated populations you have in the region that your legion is based out of, the more units you will have available to you to recruit. And this goes for levies too. Levies, okay, let's talk about some levies. Levies are different because levies are just what's already there. This is your population. These are your militias, you know, not your standing army. A levy is based in a region just like a legion is. However, instead of taking from the population pool and paying them a salary to just exist and train and build roads and whatever you're going to have them do, levies are only summoned really when you need them. You can raise all levies belonging to loyal governors. If a governor is not loyal, they will not raise their levies to fight for you. But you know, this is good and bad. It's good because you could summon armies on demand. However, they will not be elite as a legion. They will not have the army makeup that you could customize as a legion. They will have army makeups based on where they're from. So I have all my levies picked up over here. Let's let's get into a save where I could just pick levies up. All right, so here's a good example of levies I found in my save file. So this is what levies have. You see, this is looking way different than what we were already seeing in the other ones. It's because these ones are barbarians. More specifically, it's their culture you see here the culture group of the Gallic. Every culture group has a different layout for how their levies come out. A pre-generated army, so to speak, based on population size, is affected by your culture group. And so that's what determines this. They're actually all raised right now because we're... I think we were just finishing up a war here. If we wanted to disband all levies, we'd hit this button. It's just grayed out right now. Raise them all at once, you know raise each one individually. You can also put ones down individually. If you lose units or if your regions expand, you could actually hire them in the middle of already having them raised. There is this modifier right now, the levy size multiplier. This is an important multiplier. It's affected by numerous things, including your laws, including your traditions, you name it. This affects as well how population translates into cohorts. Now, this doesn't just affect levies. This also determines that number we saw earlier, which affects what you can recruit into legions as well. Typically, as you inch closer to having legions, which as you can see, we cannot have as this country, you know, we need to become a monarchy or public. We need to set laws that allow us to have legions. You're going to lose out on levy size multiply because your culture, your society is not going to be used to needing to raise and fight for themselves. They're going to be more and more used to legions being there to do it for them. 
but there are still ways to modify it upwards after. You could go the opposite route where you just find things that buff up your levy size multiplier, usually in the laws here, usually under wherever your, yeah, like your military laws. That's usually where you'll find stuff like that. These names up top are editable. You can edit the names of legions by just, you know, backspacing out, typing your mom is gay. This is now the your mom is gay legion. Bam, your mom is gay. There you go. There's a history to a legion. So as we can see, your mom is gay delivered a glorious victory in the plains of Lysimachia under the leadership of insert person. So you can kind of go back in history and see everything that has happened. You can see the military rank, the martial ranking that we discussed earlier of every general you've assigned here. The legate is the one that matters the most. The tribunes are more there for backup and for splitting legions into multiple parts. I'd suggest not even having tribunes unless you are sure that you need it or when you're initially making a legion, it actually kind of forces you to have one. You know, you click right here, pull it up. It's not going to let you make a legion unless all these are filled, which by the way, I'd make sure to fill these manually because for example, they are taking from my strongest remaining captains, but like this and this guy are the strongest and they're not putting him in charge. They're putting the weakest possible one in charge. As you can see here, five versus seven. And that one has six and then seven. If you're ever wondering why you try to go modify a legion or build a legion and some of your units that you have unlocked are not there, like where the fuck's my war elephants? Well, they are where you put them. I have war elephants for this legion. Because this legion is based out of my home, uh, where is it? My home region, right there. If I have imported that resource there, or if it goes there naturally and I still have it there, then I will be able to pull that type of unit from it into my legion. Trading can allow this, essentially, or resource exploitation. But if you do not have something like elephants or even horses, where you want to raise them, then you're not going to be able to raise them. Same goes for camels and etc. Military costs money. And in fact, it's going to be a, most of what you're spending money on more than likely in the long run of this game. If you see here, army maintenance, look at the costs and everything here. You can lower it. You can raise it. Here's some of the effects that it has. If you decrease the pay of the armies, they will be less ready for anything, but they will cost less. Your population will be happier, your integrated population, because they'll be like, we're a peaceful people. We don't need an army. It's fine. Default is default. And you can make your population a little unhappy, but raise morale if you're spending more on the military. If you're confused on why your integrated cultures would be unhappy with that, think about it like this. Back then, the only individuals that could serve in the military, and it, this goes in this game as well, were the citizens, the integrated culture. The undesirables were certainly not allowed in the military, but that doesn't mean that the desired wanted to serve in the military. So if you're increasing pay, that means you might be a warmonger, which means they might have to fight and they don't like that. The same goes all round. Looking at mercenaries, mercenaries are different. These are pre-built armies that are scattered around the map, as you can see one right here. And you can hire these mercenaries. For example, if I click on it right there, if I hit recruit right here, I'll see this. Recruiting name of mercenaries will cost an upfront cost of base 100, but you can lower it with modifiers. And this is my modifier. And they will still cost me every single month of maintenance. Mercenaries are essentially legions and they have benefits and they have debuffs. The benefits of hiring mercenaries are that you can suddenly get a bunch of units that don't rely on your own population, only your own wealth. Very good if you have a mostly unintegrated nation. So if you have a lot of unintegrated cultures, your integrated culture is not very populated, you wouldn't be able to make a whole lot of levies or a whole lot of legions. You'd need to rely on mercenaries. There are also techs that can lower the maintenance of mercenaries, that can lower the cost that can raise the amount of them you can even have. And yes, there is a limit, as you see here, maximum mercenary armies. This is limited by your size. It's limited by your technology. It's not limited by how many regions you have, such as the levies are. It's not limited by your laws, such as legions are. However, you do not dictate what is in these. You could dictate their tactics and how they form themselves, but this is chariots in it right here. And you can't change that. You're hiring something from Carthage, you know, you're hiring, it's actually Iberian probably. You're hiring something 
from a place where they have chariots. And so they will have chariots. And it's based on the culture of the location they're from. And that is it. There's nothing you could do to change it. But they also don't draw from your manpower. So if you suffer substantial losses with mercenaries, you don't lose manpower. So if you're combining them with your forces, for example, sending them in first to suffer the brunt of the enemy forces, lose a lot of things, and then send in your legions or your levies to mop up after, that could actually save you a lot of manpower, and it would not contribute to your war exhaustion. And just in case you don't already know, manpower, you know, this is your available, recruitable men of age that can serve in the military. It's affected by a ton of things, which are laid out in the tooltip. Your war exhaustion is, well, it's how pissed off your population is by war. If you're fighting with levies, this will raise much higher. It doesn't raise very much with legions because these guys, they know what they're doing. They're here to fight. And mercenaries, it doesn't raise at all because they're not even from your population. At a brief glance, you could see the marshal of the leader, so that's important. You could see the total strength of cohorts and in numbers if you want, and the monthly maintenance of everything. You could scroll up and down. They'll give you some information of their own here. You can mark whether or not, like, you only want to see recruitable ones, or you just want to see the ones that are hired, or, you know, just both. You want to see, you know, employed, not employed, hostile versus not hostile. See if they're working against you. If there are hostile mercenaries, and this can happen to you too, you can bribe them to stop working for your opponent or even start working for you. So that's something to be careful. Mercenaries are only loyal to money, not to you, not even if you pay them. So that's a downside of using them. Another downside to mercenaries is your military experience. Remember how I mentioned that earlier? You could drill your legions to get military experience faster. Your levies fighting, once they go back into your nation, you know, you're gonna have a lot of military experience from them because they'll have seen war. They'll have the experience and your society will be forged by that. Mercenaries are not from your society. They do not generate military experience for you. In fact, they reduce it because you're essentially outsourcing it. So if you want to get military traditions fast, hiring mercenaries is a very bad way to do it. And the debuff scales with your reliance on mercenaries. The more mercenaries you have and rely on, then essentially the less you will gain for military experience. Now, looking at Navy, you could see this is kind of the same thing for mercenaries. The only difference is these are pirates. They only exist where there are pirate ports, pirate havens. That's where these exist. Usually it's better to just build your own Navy, unless you like the bonuses that come with pirates and you like hiring them and you don't like maintaining your own Navy because that shit's expensive. Otherwise, you build your own ships here. There's a lot of ships that you can build Let's get a good look. There's a couple ways to look at building ships. It doesn't work any way that you might think it does. There's several ways to build ships. One is to click on a location that has a port, go to tactical and hit build ships, and you will be able to build each line of ship based upon your level of your port. The highest level of port. Well, not the highest level because it's not really a limit, but well, level five, level five port. will let you build up to the mega polyrim, whereas, you know, the starter port, you'll be building light ships only. This is the cost to recruit. This is how long it's going to take to recruit in days. And this is how much you're going to have to pay every single month once you have it. Of course, this can all be modified. You could also just select a fleet and then you could build directly to it. The buttons here are very similar. You could detach damaged ships. That's different in case you want to send them to port to repair. Repairs happen automatically when you're in friendly territory. They have their own uh, stuff here. This all pretty much works exactly the same. So, but these are different. You can have normal combat. You can have boarding combat. If you turn this on, this makes it so you're going to try to capture ships. And capturing ships, this will happen quite a lot in this era. Destroying ships is hard. And so whether you're trying to capture ships or not, you probably will. And you will probably lose some to being captured. Boarding tactics will lower your damage done, but increase your chance of capturing ships. Ramming tactics will increase damage done, but increase damage taken as well your chance to capture doesn't really change at all there. And for base values of everything, you just don't select any of these. You can capture a port if you have super heavy ships, the heaviest of ships, which are like the top two ships, the highest, hardest ones to make, and they're healthy. You could just capture a port from someone when you go next to it, and you know, you're at war with them, I believe, and you use that, then you could just capture it just like that. This is of course attaching, you could build directly to the Navy. So instead of going through ports, I could just build right here and 
the AI will sort of go across all the ports you have, seeking for where you can even build these to begin with, and then it'll try to spread the orders out to make it as fast as possible. Once the ships are built, they will come here and join this group, even if it's on the move, but they could still get intercepted. This option is good if you want to pump out ships as fast as possible and are not at risk of being intercepted. There is also a port raid here. It can cause a breach in a siege that is happening, a land siege, and I still have to show you guys that, and I will. Port assaults, which will just straight up reduce a fort level. You're essentially deleting a fort level off the map. I've talked about fort levels in my building guides. Ports are very important. We'll touch upon them more later. And a slave raid. You can just go around to neutral ports. If you have enough ships, you'll gain aggressive expansion but you will actually just grab slaves from there and bring them home to your own territory, which adds population to your own without actually going to war. This will raise your wealth. It will raise your money over time if you do this quite regularly. There is a naval range though. If we hover over, say right here, we can see it's 402 away from the nearest port that is mine. That determines my naval range. Looks like my naval range is 650. So I'm sure if I went and looked over here, yeah, 2143, that is way out of range. If I go that far, we're going to start a tritting and we're not going to be able to be very happy. If we go through uh, storms in the sea, that could be very bad. We could lose ships. We could lose damage. I mean, shit, dude, that's how Rome lost like two massive fleets. Anywhere that has a port indicated by these little symbols can be blockaded. To do that, you'll want to move a fleet, ideally one that can survive any ships that are around or in those ports, into the sea region that these ports connect to. In this case, indicated by this line leading here, move ships here and you can blockade all of these ports all at once and perform some of those other actions if you can, such as a port raid, such as a port assault, or this is where you would want to go as well if you wanted to do a slave raid, but that doesn't require war. Now, finally, if you also want to build ships, there's another way to do it. Select the macro builder here, and then you come over here to this. Select a type of ship. Everywhere in green is where you have a port that can build the ship you're trying to build. Select the heaviest one. You'll see our choices are much more limited because we barely have any ports that are big enough to do that. Just go ahead and click around, and you can queue things up to build things wherever you want, and they'll just pop out. They won't go to any specific fleet. They'll just pop out. It's a way to build ships quickly, but not directly into one force. Two things I don't think I really mentioned is these up here, chance of cohort loyalty. This is gonna show modifiers and things that will make it likely that a cohort in an army becomes loyal. It's just good to keep track of if you care. And enslavement efficiency. So if you occupy a territory, of an enemy by capturing it, quote unquote, you will automatically enslave population. This is normal for this time. In this time period, every economy functioned on slaves. No economy did not function on slaves, not even Athens. You know, people think Athens direct democracy. Yeah, if you're a citizen, everybody else was a slave. Everybody was a fucking slave in this time period. And this just shows you the efficiency of it and what's affecting it. In this case, we could see there's a base 5% rate. He's cruel, so he adds 3% and his marshal's high enough to add another 4%, and that's what that does. Now over here we have a siege. You can see some mercenaries here. They're not doing anything. They're browned out. They're not involved. They just live here. But there is a small barbarian force of 1,500 men. This is three cohorts, and you can actually see what kind of cohorts. One archer and two chariots are trying to besiege this location where I have a fort. If I didn't have a fort, they would just be able to occupy it. If I do have a fort, now they have to besiege it. And so this is where we get this. This is the siege screen. First off, you see this nun? There's too few men here. You cannot besiege something unless you have at least 2,000 men. That is a base of four cohorts. Under this value, we can see a lot of information. So the accumulation time of the siege, this hasn't been going on for very long. It hasn't even started. You can see the commander impact. Better the commander, the better the siege will go for the besieger. There's a blockade right here. You can see that if you can blockade a port of a place that's being besieged, then this will help you. If it has a port and it is being besieged and it's not being blockaded, this will hurt your attempts to siege. It will help the defenders. Right now, we are the defenders. This right here is the effect 
that every level of fortifications is having on the siege. It's minus one because we have level one forts here. If we had level four, this would be a minus four to the attacking efforts. Siege engineering is a value based on texts and military traditions your enemy might have that might modify the siege. These are barbarians besieging, so they don't have any. Engineers can also assist a siege. They don't have any. But the more you bring, the better sieges will go. Breaches in the wall make it easier to assault. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then every month, it rolls some dice to see how well you do. You can see the morale. You could see the order assault button. Basically, you'll take any men that you have that can participate in an assault, and then you can have them assault the defending garrison in the fortifications. For this, you'll want breaches in the fortifications. And still, this will be deadly because there is fort defense. And this will affect how efficient the garrison is at defending. Just because you have a big army doesn't mean that the siege will go well. It's going to be very bloody, way more bloody than actually just besieging it. This might be another reason to consider your unit composition because only three units in the game can actually assault a city. Archers, heavy, and light infantry. Cavalry cannot go through a breach in a wall. Chariots won't be able to do it. War elephants will not be able to do it. Only infantry, including archers. This button is to assume control of a siege. Let's say these guys were my allies and they were besieging. And if I arrived with more men, I could assume control of the siege to decide when we assaulted, if we did. I could apply my bonuses to the siege instead of theirs. And more importantly, if we win, I would get the territory and not them. This is the fort level you have to get through. This is the one doing the siege. This is the one defending the siege. This is the attrition that units that are participating in the siege are going to be suffering. This is the enslavement bonus that I had shown you before. And this is the commander in charge of the siege. Now this is what it looks like when a siege is about to happen. You see, we, well not a siege, a battle. We're movement locked because we've committed to moving here for too long. Now we cannot change our mind about going. Our movement is grayed out. Otherwise it would be colorful and this would not be here. This affects AI as well to prevent them from just, you know, cheating and moving instantaneously like they did in older Paradox games. I mean, they'll still do that, but now there's a period where they can't do it. And that's still newer in the series comparatively. This shows an imminent battle. This green color means it's very likely we will win and it talks about why. It shows the sides that will be fighting the commanders. It's saying we have a stronger army. Our army has higher morale than theirs. We have a big enough army to instantly eliminate their army. That's a very important note. But the terrain is to their benefit and our commander is not as skilled. This is kind of like the terrain it's showing. There's no hover over, but it's planes. Now, this is a good time to mention the other use of engineers. Let's say you're crossing a river, then the defender on the other side is actually going to have a, a buff. They're going to be able to defend against you a lot easier if you have to cross a river. However, if you have one engineer cohort per 10 cohorts that you have in your army here, then you can actually completely negate that debuff because they essentially allow you to cross. Now, it did say we would eliminate them pretty much immediately and we go ahead and we attack and we arrive there is still a battle however and this is kind of what it looks like so this is the front line this is what we have <laughs> this isn't really a great battle but this is what the battle screen looks like this is what they have and this is what we have here as you can see they have shock action bottleneck is better so they're at always a flat 10% debuff for doing damage, but we still have now a 17% buff due to the effectiveness of our army with bottlenecks. So it's like a double entendre kind of thing. This is their discipline and this is ours. Discipline is very, very important. Your discipline level, which it doesn't really show anywhere that's very easy to see on the actual military screens, which is great for such an important stat. But discipline is essentially just the raw effectiveness of your men. The higher the discipline, the more elite they are generally. Note, generally. Remember earlier I showed you things that buffed up different units? Well, that has an effect as well. That's like a separate discipline modifier that goes in tandem with this discipline modifier. But they both matter, but this one will be the only one displayed. And if you hover over here, you can see some information such as all my engineers are in reserve. Good. I don't want them fighting. All my supply trains are in reserve. Good. You can see six of my heavy infantry are in reserve. 
as well as well, actually that's it that's because there wasn't enough space this is a plane so the combat width is very high and you can kind of see also the stats of the battle right here and the units involved in it you can see the width is very high so we can fit a ton of enemies in here at once you can see that the heavy cavalry has gone to the flanks to serve as a, a flanking force really because that's what I told them to do. Whereas the front is filled with heavy infantry and there are heavy infantry in the rear that are going to move up and support them as well. Now, if this was an actual real big battle, you would see the animations as they moved up and attacked. You could track the men and the morale of every cohort currently engaged in combat as well as which ones are in reserves that can help. You could see which ones are fleeing and animates all that as well. You could see whether or not you have the ability to retreat if you select your men separately and try to retreat. Here's the combat with, yeah, you could fit 40 units in a plane. So that's quite a bit. That means we literally probably have 40 units lined up right here to just their three. Now this is where combat with is important. If you were in a narrow mountain pass defending, you could try to hold my units off for quite a bit with limited amounts of units. But in a plane? Nah, dude, we're just going to surround you. And that ties in with some things I've said in some of my um, other guides like building for example, if you're building an earthworks in a town, you lower the combat width. And that can be really important to defending a location, is lowering the combat width. I believe they ended up essentially making that a very important mechanic in something like Hearts of Iron 4 as well. That all pretty much traces back to Hearts of Iron 3, I believe. Maybe 2 as well, I don't remember. As fighting goes on, the enemy morale will suffer because we're obviously going to win. This is going to be pretty much instant. The moment I unpause, one day goes by, we just killed them all. Usually there'd be a pop-up telling you, like, okay, you killed this many, they killed this many, and who won, and the loser has to retreat back to friendly territory. They get put in that full retreat mode, and the winner gets to keep going about their business with whatever casualties they've taken. It is entirely possible to have a negative KDR, yet overwhelm your opponent's morale and actually win the battle. So, keep that in mind. Now, I believe I've taught you everything there really is to know about military, but let's give some honorable mentions to have some diplomatic things that interact with military, okay? If I wanted to declare a war, for example, right-click, declare war. We need a war goal, otherwise we're going to lose some stuff. Or, you know, we also need to make sure we don't have military access. That's important as well. I believe I spoke about that in the beginner's guide. We also, here's the war without Casas Belly. We take some debuffs. When we take stuff, when we win in wars, we earn aggressive expansion. This is basically meaning we're bad guys, we're warmongers, and it comes with only negative effects. If it gets to 50, you're going to start having a lot of problems. But even then, maybe you can't handle it going above 30. Definitely be careful before conquering a bunch of stuff or before doing an insane amount of slave raids because this is a very hard thing to deal with, as is war exhaustion. But war exhaustion can actually also be good because high war exhaustion increases your military experience. A few final notes is for commanders. For commanders, if it's a legion, you assign the legate and his tribunes. You have full control over that. If it's a levy, the governor is the one that's going to lead it in. So remember how I said you can have your leader visit things? Well, there's a way to do it. Just raise what he governs as a levy, which will always be your capital. But that goes for other things. So when assigning governors, if you rely on levies, make sure they're also good at military, not just the statesman stuff. If you're playing a barbarian, then this levy system changes a little bit because you'll have these tribal leaders that take the place of governors, and then you have even less control of them. But with that, I believe that's everything I need to cover in a military guide, and I believe this has gone on long enough. So. I hope that this guide was helpful to you. If you think of anything else that you need help with that you want me to cover that I haven't already covered in this or previous guides, please let me know in the comments below. Coming up with ideas is very difficult. Oh yeah, and you should go without saying, mercenaries, you can't change their leader. It's the mercenary leader, so of course. But for now, thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>